Hello, everyone, and welcome back from lunch. Hopefully the catering was as awesome as the catering was here. Um, I would like to introduce Simon. Uh, Simon will be discussing with us the architecture and software that they chose um, in making their API public. Uh, Simon is a creative technologist at Acme, your museum of screen culture, which is um, in Melbourne, a software developer, maintainer at uh, New Internationalist magazine, and an open source uh, software and hardware enthusiast uh, he helped set up the MOD, which is the Museum of Discovery, and Hackerspace in Adelaide. So on to you, Simon. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I will set my screen sharing going. Okay. So, hi, everybody. Uh, first, I'd like to acknowledge the Ghana people as the traditional owners of the unceded lands that I'm speaking from today. Uh, always was, always will be Aboriginal land. And for those who haven't been to Acme, um, we're me your museum of screen culture in Federation Square, Melbourne, Victoria. We usually have about 1.5 million visitors a year and our new experience, the story of the moving image takes you on an interactive journey of screen culture in the films, video games, TV and art. Uh, it's also free, so you should all come and visit. Um, last year, I talked about how we built the digital infrastructure and private APIs that power Acme, uh, including how we deploy about 400 Raspberry Pis and Dell microcomputers. Uh, and this year, I'm back to talk about the work that our team has done releasing our first public API. Uh, you can see it in your browser at api.acme.net.au. Um, that's a lovely little screenshot over here. Um, so, how, uh, why did we build it? Um, we received public funding uh, at Acme, so we figured that the data that we make should be public too. Um, and what do I mean by the data we make? Um, well, museum collections might include uh, works that are held on behalf of communities whose intellectual property is owned by the creators until it enters the public domain, um, and also scholarly scholarly descriptive metadata about those works that museums create themselves. So we're allowed to release the descriptive metadata, um, but not the works in most cases. Um, our CXO, Seb Chan, uh, describes this really well. So I'll just pop in a bit from him. So he writes, uh, Acme might hold a copy of Mad Max, but owns no IP to release even when it digitizes that copy because the underlying work is still in copyright. However, Acme owns all of the IP around what it says about Mad Max and can release that without seeking additional permissions. So other museums uh, hold things whose underlying IP is now in the public domain because they are so old. Uh, this allows them to release the work itself. Um, Acme's collection is very young and doesn't have this option. Uh, we do have some works that were uh, produced as government films. And so they fall under the crown copyright as well as other works that are called orphan works because they have no known copyright owner. Uh, there are a third set of works whose creators have given us limited rights to release on other platforms controlled and administered by Acme. Uh, and these are what are on our YouTube channel. Um, another reason we wanted to build it uh, is for regular updates. So our last data release was five years ago and we'd really like to release more frequently, so nightly, if possible. Uh, we wanted to build for accessibility. So when we build the public labels API, um, that one is what we're going to use so that visitors can translate and read all of the labels that appear at Acme using their own screen readers. Um, and we also wanted to be able to create more rich data links um, so that we can match collections data with other institutions. So this might include uh, IDs from other film collections like the DFF in Germany or else data sources like Wikidata. And we also love experimentation. So we wanted to build applications that extend and transform our data. Um, and a public API is super useful for that. So uh, before we built it, we needed to answer who we were really building it for. Um, primarily, we're building it for researchers who uh, might use it to study representation and demographics in our data. Um, we also thought we should build it for technologists uh, and take that into account. So we envisage them using it in hackathons and to build visualizations. Uh, we also need it for internal use. 
Um, so we've got three teams, uh, technical teams at Acme, the audio visual team, the information technology team, and also the team that I belong to, uh, Experience and Digital. Uh, and we've all got creative people in there who love writing code. So the public API allows us to develop applications with our collection starter without uh, the fear of bringing down the private museum's API, because um, that would suck. Um, and we also built it for you. So we would love to hear what you think of it, if there's anything we can improve, and most importantly, what you build with it. Um, here are a couple of examples from RMIT students who used our 2016 metadata. Um, so here they explore gender rem representation uh, on the left and also uh, the country of origin of works in our collection on the right. Um, they generated these images using the metadata spreadsheet that were released back then. Um, but with the public API, these could now be live and interactive. Uh, so this is a big dependency map of XOS uh, that we built uh, last year, that I presented last year at the conference. Uh, and all of the applications that serves in our museum and external facing websites. Um, don't worry if you can't read it, it's just to give you an idea of all of the things. Um, so as you can see, a lot depends on the XOS uh, uptime and performance, uh, and hence the need for our public API, API not to put any extra strain on it during museum opening hours. Um, the private APIs it exposes currently, uh, the taps when people tap their lens, uh, a lenses API for the lens itself, the constellations, works, creators, playlists, monitor devices, labels, images, and videos. So over time, we'll release all of these as open APIs. Um, but first, we wanted to focus on the collection works API, which is the one I'm talking about now. So how do we build it? Um, so we had XOS, which is our museum operating system. Um, and that was really lovely. And so what we wanted to build was um, a glorified offline cache that was serving JSON from the file system. Um, and so the public code repository of this public API that we've released uh, includes the API server software itself, as well as the uh, collections metadata in both JSON and TSV file formats. Um, so most of the rights filtering is done uh, in XOS, and that inherits the logic from our collections uh, CMS, which is called Vernon. Um, but some of the last minute tasks, uh, or we had some last minute risk averse decisions by the organization, which meant we had to do a little bit more rights filtering on the public API. So um, we've got some logic that we're gonna roll back into XOS uh, after we've built the business decision fields into Vernon. So it'll get cleaner over time, which is great. Um, but having the API code and the metadata all in the one repo uh, means that researchers can git clone our repo and have all of the data ready to go. Um, plus, it also isolates our private museum APIs completely from the public so that they don't have any chance of accidentally breaking things either. Um, so what we used was uh, Alpine Linux Docker container. Um, the main reasons are it's small, secure, fast, um, we can do repeatable builds and use the same uh, image for development and production, which is really nice. Uh, in terms of the underlying software, um, the majority of our code at Acme is written in Python. So the dream result was a Python-based framework with minimal dependencies that was quick and easy to prototype and develop. So Flask was a really good choice for that. Uh, in terms of search, we went with um, Elastic Cloud in production. Uh, and a matched Elasticsearch Docker image for development. So the same re-indexing code runs on staging and development, which allows us uh, for easy updates and testing and bug fixing, which is great. Uh, in terms of the infrastructure, um, the Acme ICT team has a background with Microsoft. Uh, so we use Terraform to build the infrastructure on Azure services, uh, making use of horizontal auto scaling to handle temporary load increases if the API CPUs average 70% or higher for a significant amount of time. Um, we're finding Terraform pretty good because it makes spinning up new servers quite easy, uh, though it adds uh, quite a bit more tech debt to our small team of two devs. Uh, in terms of uh, nightly updates uh, to the API, um, while building a separate repo for the API update, I realized that a cron job in the actual public API code repo could do the same job. So 
So now uh, CronJob runs the same code, um, which calls our XOS private works API. Uh, it downloads the JSON blobs uh, and saves them to the file system. Um, and then we've got another little bit of code that removes the image and videos that we don't have rights to. And once it's finished, uh, it just checks for the Git changes. Um, if it finds them, then it pushes those changes back to uh, the code, the GitHub repo, uh, which tr triggers a GitHub action to run the linting and tests before deploying the changes to staging on top of itself, which is quite cool. So that's how um, it updates the code repo by itself. Um, we have a, an environment variable for toggling updates via Terraform um, in a config map. So this makes it really easy to turn off any updates if um, without any code changes to the API repo, just in case we have any problems. Uh, and we also have environment variables for including images and videos. So over time, as we've got all the rights ready, um, we'll add them to the public API just via a uh, Terraform toggle, which is cool. Um, in production, uh, we trigger manual releases uh, weekly. And this is done via GitHub um, after we've done some data validation on staging, just to make sure we haven't broken anything. Uh, and then we use a G Unicorn server to serve the JSON to you. Um, in development, um, we provide an environment variable to switch between the Flask server while building new features. So you can do um, hot reloading. Uh, and also the Genicon server for testing as well, just if you want to test the production uh, server on your laptop too. Um, so I thought I'd give a quick demo of how all of that runs using Docker Compose. So um, we pull a clone of the repo, um, we CD into development folder, and then simply run Docker Compose up. And that starts the API search container uh, with Elasticsearch and also the API uh, itself. So here it is running. Um, if we switch over to our browser and head to port 8081, uh, there you can see it. Um, so you can also go to works and see an index page of all the 42,000 um, files there. And you can also paste in the ID and grab like a one object uh, returned. And this is just showing that the, the search works locally as well. So that's Elasticsearch returning the results um, of a search too. So um, what were the results? Um, so without any optimization to Genicorn yet, um, this is the speed that we got coming back uh, for all of our requests. So when there are about three requests a second, it's about 158 milliseconds, going up to 18 requests a second, about you know half a second. So um, that's running pretty well for $100 a month. Um, and this is on the standard Azure D2 V2 nodes. In terms of time uh, to build this, the first commit we made just doing the rough prototypes using Flask was on the 5th of July. Um, and then on the 23rd of September, we had uh, our infrastructure running and everything running in production, which was cool. Um, so that gave us a lot of time to do the final touches for the 11th of November. So about four months. Um, in terms of dependencies and security, um, because of the limited number of Alpine and Python dependencies, we don't pin dependencies at all. So they update nightly with every build, giving us a pretty reasonable security posture, which is nice. Um, and we've documented everything over at acme.netju slash API. So hopefully the document is, documentation is easy to read, but um, have a go. Let me know if it needs any updates or anything. Um, we've also got a blog post um, with a bit more history and some prototypes. So you can pop there at labs.acme.nd. Um, and in terms of the prototypes, um, because we found the majority of bugs early in our testing, because uh, we built the private APIs, uh, that was great. But using the public API ourselves for prototypes helped uncover a few more, which was really useful. Um, so both the prototype applications we built uh, run in Jupyter Notebooks, which means they can be run for free on Google Colab online. So you don't even need to run any of this code on your own computer if you're um, ultra paranoid, or just usually paranoid. Um, so the first one we built was Machine Dreaming. Um, this one generates images from our works metadata. Um, so we thought it might be useful seeing that we didn't actually release the images and videos uh, for launch. 
And the second one uh, matches Wikidata biographies to uh, Acme creators. So, there, so that's quite too cool too. Um, then since we've released it, we've had some public use, which is really, really nice. Um, so Paul from NFSA, which is the National Film and Sound Archive of Australia, uh, he used the API to match Acme works to Wikidata entities. So um, we started matching creators. He's matching works now, and it's really, really lovely. Um, the other use was by Aaron from San Francisco Museum. Uh, he matched Acme accession numbers to website URLs, which is going to be really handy for accessibility, accessibility labels. So he's working on a project so that all museums can share this code, um, which will read a museum label and take you directly to the website, which is very cool. Uh, the other thing we learned about just recently is that Wikimedia Australia have launched a thousand dollar fellowships um, and they're featuring the Acme public API as an example project. Um, so if you're into data, you should definitely apply for that. Uh, it looks really fun. So um, here you can see the first machine dreaming prototype um, that we created. So this is using the metadata from um, the matrix. Uh, and so uh, I don't know if you know, I'll give you a little bit of history about GANs. So GANs are machine learning models that pit one network that generates the output against another that classifies that output. Um, so they're used a lot in generative music, text, and images. Um, and VQGAN plus CLIP, which is uh, what we're using here, um, that combines uh, machine learning models that generate the image from text. Um, so that's we use that to pass the Acme metadata. In this case, um, it's split. Uh, so we pass in the title first and then the um, brief description. Uh, all split by a maximum number of characters, which it can handle, uh, and it generates that image. Um, so, as you probably know, machine learning models carry the biases which they're trained on, and so it looks likely that there is probably a matrix poster in the training data that we use, given how similarly that looks. Um, likewise, this dreamt image from our Mad Max metadata. Um, it looks like there might have been some film stills in the training data as well, given how accurate uh, that looks to some of the characters in there. And so it's showing like every frame is one more step um, that it thinks uh, is closer to the image that it's dreamt up based on that metadata. So there's about 200 steps per um, uh, in our example that we used. Uh, here we fed it the video game of The Hobbit, um, but clearly the training data had an image of the book in there. so. Um, it kind of dreamt up the book rather than a video game, which is not surprising seeing it's a Spectrum game. So, yeah. Um, the last one here, uh, the training set also appears to know that Outback Australia is Aboriginal land too, which is very nice. So if you'd like to try some others, uh, as I mentioned, our notebooks run for free on Google Crylab servers, and there's a link to it in our Acme GitLab um from the blog post api documentation and also all of these links in the slides work so um you can download them after my talk so in terms of challenges um so we wanted to release everything as creative commons zero licenses um but yeah we couldn't for many reasons um seb chan uh the ct cxo uh, has some really nice words about this so he writes uh, this is not hard because of technical reasons, but because of copyright laws, ethical consideration of creators' rights outside of copyright laws, such as Indigenous IP. So he asks, should Indigenous works ever enter the public domain? Uh, and other, also other moral rights. Uh, ACME, and no museum, has re uh, resources to manually research, contact, clear, and relicense every work in its collection for all purposes. Some, some works we have in our collection even need us to contact the creator or their estate to show in an exhibition. Other works were acquired before the web existed and thus don't have flexibility without recontacting the rights holder. Uh, so we had to remo remove a large portion of our collection from our public API for this first release. Um, the other challenge is uh, expectations. So um, Seb writes again, museum data isn't very useful uh, without being combined with other data sources. There's no easy open gov model for reuse to apply. Uh, there is no, when is the next bus arriving app to make. Uh, Acme 
has tried to build the scaffolding in the data to make it easier to connect with other public and private data sets to make the data we hold more useful, but understand that this is not in the general operations of the museum, so needs automation and tolerance for error. For example, uh, when we're pulling in metadata from IMDB or TD TMDB or Wikidata IDs, um, that's not part of ACME's cataloging process, but added later. So they're essential for making ACME's data to be able to be worked with, um, but sometimes there are some errors in that auto linking. Um, data creation is slow. So even though we've got uh, an automated uh, transcoding set up at Acme now, um, digitizing a film from the analog film takes about four times the runtime of that footage in staff labor. Um, so Seb also writes on that, uh, cataloging a film takes significant research time, especially if the film is unique to us, along with some or all of the people involved or featured in the film. Because data creation is slow, we also have records that are very old and featured, feature language that was common, uh, in common use in previous decades that may be considered offensive or inappropriate in modern time. Remember that ACME was the state film archive all the way back to the 1940s. This means that there is uh, internal concern about what previous language might say about us now, and this creates more work to fix the data. These are human cultural issues that manifest in risk aversion. Uh, another challenge was just the sheer update time. So updating 45,000 records and doing some uh, changes to them takes about four hours. So we run the update overnight, which is great. Um, but if we need to do any live fixes, then yeah, it takes about four hours. So we've got a bit of a turnaround time there. Uh, and also the, uh, the, git, the nightly git diffs on 45,000 files. Uh, sometimes fails on the pods because they've got a limited amount of memory. So um, we've got a bit of a struggle keeping the resources really low and then making sure that the diffs don't kill the pods. Uh, thank you. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge the excellent work done by our original team who built the private XOS APIs. So uh, Ali Haberfield, Andrew Sarong, Benjamin Laird, David Amores, uh, Greg Turner, the CTO at the time, uh, Pipshi uh, and myself, uh, and also want to acknowledge our new developer, Sam Mayer, for his help through this process, which has been excellent. Um, also, shout out to our bosses, so Seb Chan, Amazing Guy, Lucy Patterson, brilliant, uh, Francesco Romini, uh, who's my direct boss, uh, who puts up with me a lot, which is great. Um, if you'd like to see the slides, uh, there's a link to them there, so sidhmon.com slash acme, um, and that's it. Any questions? Uh, thank you, Simon. We've got a few questions for you. Um, oh, cool. Are you asking users to sign in or up uh, so you can get some usage stats at all? Or are you just providing HTTP access? No, it's totally open. So um, we thought about uh, doing API keys and that sort of thing. Um, so at the moment, we've got absolutely no analytics on people using it other than how much CPU load uh, is on our pods at the moment. So we'll keep it like that until we need to worry about costs or anything. Um, is there a skew to the data that is being looked up? Anything interesting or surprising or any new APIs you've been asked for? Um, we haven't actually had time to look through the data ourselves yet. So <laughs> we've just been building this thing. Um, so I suspect we, uh, as we work with different universities uh, who are going to do projects with it, um, we'll find out a lot of cool things. Um, sorry, what was the second half of the question? Um, is there any any new APIs you've been asked for? Uh, nothing we've been asked for yet, but I think um, a creators API and a labels API are probably the logical next ones. But yeah, if anyone else wants any of our other private APIs I mentioned opened up, then definitely email, because uh, that always helps me get the bosses to prioritize it. So it'll be really useful. Um, another question here. I'm curious as to how you support and build relationships with users. How do you approach documentation, community, and building awareness of your data availability? Um, yeah, so we've got uptime monitors to make sure our API is um, up and um, available. Uh, but seeing it's brand new, we really haven't um, had that many problems yet. So if you can crash it, that'd be great. <laughs> and we will 
uh, please get in touch if you do and tell us how you crashed it so we can we can make it more stable. Uh, in terms of building community, um, that's a good one. Uh, giving talks like this, um, we're hoping to connect with other organizations. Um, the State Library in Melbourne are doing some really interesting things uh, with machine learning at the moment and auto categorization. So it'd be really great to work with um, people who are doing uh, tagging and categorization because uh, that's what we need help with in our collection. Um, have you had any data sovereignty issues being raised around the use of commercial cloud services like AWS or Google as you've worked through getting your public API up and running? Uh, haven't yet. That's probably a good one for Seb Chan to answer. So, um, yeah, ping him at Seb Chan on Twitter and ask any questions like that. He's, he's a good one for those. Wonderful. And one last question. Have you had any issues with lawyers not understanding Floss software licenses, i.e. coming from all software must be licensed or else it's stolen model, um, or insisting that a signed license or non-disclosure agreements, uh, but then adding exceptions, that sort of thing? Uh, we haven't yet, Touchwood. So I'm sure um, down the track, uh, as we try and release images and videos um, and a lot of other external uh, content, then um, yeah, we're gonna run into a lot. But I think we took a pretty cautious approach with this first um, dump of data uh, where it's all just stuff that we've created uh, ourselves. Wonderful, well, thank you very much. Um, Seb, oh, sorry. Well, you said, but you keep mentioning said, that's probably why. Um, <laughs> Simon will be available in the GoGlam chat functionality, which is to the left-hand side of your screen. But we will be moving into uh, Catherine's session, which is at 2 p.m. in the video chat session called GoGlam-ShovelReadyGlamour Graduates. Uh, so I'll see you all there at uh, 2 p.m. Thank you, Simon. Thanks so much.